The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Lauren Moskowitz comes to St. John's University as an assistant professor of psychology. She received her BS from Cornell University and her MA and PhD in clinical psychology from Stony Brook University. She completed her internship at NYU Child Study Center and Bellevue Hospital and her postdoctoral fellowship at NYU Child Study Center. Her research focuses on behavioral assessment and intervention for children with autism spectrum disorders and other disabilities in naturalistic contexts. She also focuses on intervention for parents of children with autism and DD and cognitive behavioral therapy with children and adolescents. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, nice, to, nice to meet everyone um, over the internet. This is my first time doing a webinar, so very exciting. Um, so I'm here today uh, to talk about assessing and treating challenging behaviors, sometimes referred to as problem behaviors, in individuals with autism spectrum disorders and other developmental disabilities. So I'd like to dedicate this talk to uh, my late mentor, Ted Carr, who was a real pioneer in the field of intervention research for individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities. He was one of the co-founders of positive behavior support and functional behavior assessment. Um, and really just a huge inspiration to me. And I hope to, I always aim to try to make him proud in everything I do. So um, you'll probably hear me quoting him a bunch of times because uh, he's, uh, like I said, he's always kind of sitting on my shoulder um, gu guiding me. Okay. All right. So the topic that I'm going to talk about today is challenging behavior. Like I said, it's often referred to as problem behavior. And by that, we really just mean any behavior that's a problem. That includes aggression, you know, hitting, kicking. Um, self-injury, um, hitting or biting or scratching oneself, for example, property destruction, uh, ripping papers, breaking desks, breaking pencils. For one of my kids with autism, it was uh, spreading milk or peanut butter all over the classroom and rolling in it, that sort of fun thing. Uh, tantrum behaviors, such as, you, you all know what a tantrum probably looks like, I don't need to explain that. Disruptive behaviors, it could be cursing, yelling, screaming, uh, spitting. Non-compliance, um, not listening, not listening when parents or teachers uh, give it a certain direction, and repetitive behaviors or stereotypes such as rocking, hand flapping, finger flicking, etc. Um, all a lot of those behaviors that are of course associated with autism and other developmental disabilities. And this also includes perseverative speech, uh, talking about the same thing over and over again, for example. Really anything that is a problem for you, elopement, running away, all of these things can be considered challenging behaviors. And they can all be treated using some of the same procedures we'll talk about today. So why is it important to address these things? Um, Problem behaviors aren't part of the diagnostic criteria of autism. Of course, those are social and communication impairments and repetitive or stereotypic behaviors. But what we do know is challenging behaviors are why kids often come to the clinic. Those, that's why kids often come to see me, why parents bring their kids. And the reason for that is because it really impairs their quality of life. It prevents them from integrating into the community. It's what keeps them out of neighborhood schools. It's what really um, can demoralize family members. Um, Parents are so embarrassed when their kids tantruming in the in the supermarket or in Target. It can really increase the likelihood of institutionalization, which really leads to a loss of choice and control in the lives of these individuals. And of course, it can lead to rejection by others. Um, it's it's you know it's people don't want to be friends with someone who's hitting or yelling or screaming or biting or kicking. And of course, it can lead to uh, impaired self-esteem in the individuals themselves. Often. Our kids with autism, after they have a tantrum or a meltdown and they're hitting people, they feel bad later on and they regret it and they wish that they had been able to control it better. So for all these reasons and more, and the other thing I'll add too is it really is what keeps families from going out. They often stay at home with their kids, which of course impairs their social support. So for all these reasons and more, you know, problem behavior really destroys families' quality of life and that's why it's such an important issue for us to address. So how do we understand challenging behavior? I'm going to go over the basic assumptions of apply, both applied behavior analysis and positive behavior support, which is, is what I do. 
Um, these are the basic assumptions or, or behavioral principles we're sort of working on. And the first is that behavior is learned. And you know that that's often a confusing or kind of controversial statement when I present to parents. They often say, "Well, you know, I didn't teach my child how to spit. I didn't teach my child how to hit." But few, you know, most problem behaviors are not really learned through direct instruction. Most behaviors, period, are not really learned through direct instruction outside of academics. Of course, academics is learned through direct or didactic instruction. But most other behaviors that we engage in, we we learn through the consequences that follow it, called opera conditioning, or we learn through association, classical conditioning, or we learn through watching other people and imitating them, which is called modeling or observational learning. So in general, like, like I said, most behaviors are learned by the consequences that follow it. So what that means is if I tell a joke and other people laugh, I learn what? I learn to tell that joke again, right? And if I touch a hot stove and I get burned, I learn what? Usually I have people answering in the audience, so I, but I'm still pausing to give you time to think about it in your head. Um, you learn not to touch that stove again because you got burned, right? So that's actually how a lot of beha most behaviors are really learned. And that's how problem behaviors are learned too. The good news about that is if you can learn problem behaviors, you can learn appropriate behaviors to replace those problematic behaviors. Related to the principle that behavior is learned by the consequences that follow it, another way to really think about that is that behavior is functional. Behavior serves a function or it serves a purpose, right? So like I said, if I tell a joke and other people laugh, I tell that joke again. What that means is I'm telling that joke because it was reinforced. The purpose or the function of that joke is to get a laugh or get a reaction or get attention from other people, right? So what that means, again, is behavior is happening for a reason. In this cartoon, you see the little girl falling asleep, and she thinks, this is great. I'll have to wake up crying in the middle of the night more often, right? Obviously, a little kid's not really thinking about it like that, most likely. So it doesn't mean people are actually plotting out um, the function in their head, thinking, mm hmm, if I hit someone, they're going to give me attention. But our, the behavior still serves a function. It still gets the person that need met. They have a certain need that needs to get met, and the behavior is, again, serving that need for them. And the third real principle is that behavior depends on context. It doesn't occur in a vacuum. Often when I'm interviewing, first interviewing parents or teachers about the challenging behavior, the parents or teachers will say, the problem, it, it occurs all the time. He's hitting all the time. He's biting all the time. He's screaming all the time. And you know what? It can feel like that often because the behavior is sometimes so intense or so severe that it feels like it's occurring all the time. But usually when we do a thorough functional behavior assessment that we see that the behavior really isn't happening all the time. It's occurring in a specific context. It's occurring more with mom than in dad, with dad, or it's occurring more at home than at school, or it's occurring more with social studies teacher than math teacher, or it's occurring only at uh, Target, right? So what we usually see is, again, it happens in a certain context. And again, that, that's useful information. All of that can help us design an intervention. So to expand a little bit on that point of behavior serves a function, you know, I'm probably going to hit you all over the head with this because it is such an important point. Often people will say to me, you know, my kid hits, what do I do? Or my kid bites, what do I do? And you know, we can't really answer that without knowing what the function of the behavior is. We have to address the behavior based on knowing what purpose it serves for that individual, what the reason is, right? So again, kids, kids or adults, not just kids, but any of us engage in behavior because it pays off in, serve, in some way. It serves some function or purpose. The behavior is only persisting because it's meeting some immediate need for that kid or adult. So if you have a kid who you see, you know, who's tantruming in the grocery store, again, that tantruming is serving a purpose. Waiting in line at the grocery store could be boring or overwhelming or overstimulating. So tantruming could hurt, help serving the purpose of Maybe mom takes them out of the grocery store, so they get out of the grocery store and they feel less overwhelmed. Or maybe they are tantruming and mom gives them a lot of attention, and so that reduces their boredom. Or mom buys them something on the checkout line, and that also can maybe reduce their boredom. right? So again, the, the tantrum is helping them get their need met in some way. right? Some of the most common reasons that challenging behaviors persist um, is because children or adults want or need to basically, the, the themes are they either want to they either get something or they get out of something. They escape or avoid something. 
So the most common things that uh, people engage in problem behaviors to get are often parents or peeper, pe peers, I'm sorry, or teachers or other people's attention, right? Or, like I said, sometimes individuals engage in problem behavior to get what we call a tangible item, a preferred item or activity. So maybe candy in the checkout line in the grocery store. Or a lot of my kids may engage in problem behavior to get access to the iPad or the computer. Those are popular ones nowadays. Or to get um, some other preferred activity or thing that they want, basically. And then another reason is to obtain some sort of sensory stimulation. Um, Similar to why you might, for instance, bite your nails. Some people bite their nails or some people might tap their foot, right? Um, there are certain behaviors that people engage in just because, you know, even when no one else is around because it feels good in some way. It helps bring up or bring down their arousal to a manageable level. So all of these things are positive reinforcement when you are engaging a behavior to get something, basically. And the other main reasons um, children or adults engage in problematic behaviors is to escape or avoid something, essentially to get out of something. And that's negative reinforcement. That could include escaping or avoiding a certain demand, such as make your bed or brush your teeth or do your homework. It could be escaping or avoiding social interaction, which is often very common for individuals on the spectrum. Um, it could include escaping or avoiding an anxiety-provoking situation or anxiety-provoking thing. Or it could include escaping or avoiding a, some sort of aversive sensory stimulation, like the sound of a vacuum or the sound of a blender or, or uh, bright lights in a store, something of that sort. So again, you know, we, in order to really know how to address the behavior, we have to figure out which of these reasons or functions the behavior serves. And it could often serve multiple functions. So these are the sorts of things we're trying to think about. And again, this is true for all of us. This is true for every individual. The reason it's even more important to really think about the function of the behavior for individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities is because with most people, it's probably a safe bet that the attention is reinforcing, for example. With individuals with autism or other developmental disabilities, their problematic behaviors can serve a greater or a wider array, array of functions, really. It could be, like we said, to escape or avoid social interaction or to obtain or, or escape sensory stimulation, which doesn't maybe occur as frequently in neurotypical individuals. Although, of course, I mentioned we all engage in some of those behaviors. I bite my nails, for example, and so that's a, sen a behavior that serves the purpose of sensory stimulation for me, right? So again, we all engage in behaviors that serve all of these functions, but the majority of us are motivated by attention and praise, and that's not necessarily always the case for individuals on the spectrum. So again, it's really, really important to figure out what motivates them. Okay, um, another way of thinking about the fact that behavior serves a function is that behavior is actually a form of communication. And this is more of a metaphorical way of thinking about it, but it really often helps parents or teachers to think about it in this way. Um, it helps them sort of uh, conceptualize their kids a little bit differently. And so, you know, again, you know, you might feel a little bit less angry if you think, okay, my child is tantruming uh, just because he's disobedient. That might feel a little different than thinking, my child's tantruming because he's trying to say, hey, pay attention to me, look at me, talk to me, or I'm overwhelmed in the store, I need to get out of the store, or, you know, I, I really, really want that book over there, but I don't know how to say that, right? Often individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities, they have real impairments in communication. And so problem behavior is their way to communicate their wants and needs because they don't have a better way. So our job is to help them get their needs met in a more appropriate way, to communicate their needs in a better way. So I, I know I said I'd be quoting uh, my advisor, Ted Carr, uh, but he would always really emphasize to us that if you select an intervention only based on the child's behavior and really ignore all the environmental reasons for that behavior, you can at best stop the behavior temporarily because the reasons for it are still continuing to exist. And I remember one of the first cases I had really drove that point home it was a girl um, with the developmental disabilities who had just started the ninth grade. She was in a new school, high school. She was very, very overwhelmed by the new classroom, a, a large, large classroom. And she was used to a smaller classroom, you know, with different kids. And so she frequently engaged in a lot of disruptive behaviors, yelling, screaming, animal noises, various things. Um, and her teachers would send her to sit out in the hallway um, when she engaged in that disruptive behavior. That might have been a reasonable strategy if the function of her behavior was to obtain attention 
from the from the teachers or her peers. However, it was very clear, you know, once we did a functional assessment, that the function of her behavior was to escape the classroom, to leave the classroom. She was overwhelmed in the classroom, didn't want to be in the classroom. So every time her teacher sent her out in the hallway, it stopped that behavior in the moment, but it made her more likely to engage in that behavior in the future because she learned, hey, anytime I don't want to be in class, that's what I have to do. I have to yell or scream or make animal noises and they send me out of class, right? And this is a common problem um, with, with many of the common behavioral uh, <laughs> interventions we see in schools, which is sending kids to the principal's office or sending them to sit out in the hall. Often what they want is to leave class. So again, we're only kind of making the behavior worse or reinforcing it every time we do that. So it's really important to really think about what what kind of purpose the behavior is serving for this individual because by helping them, helping the behavior to serve that purpose, again, we're only uh, reinforcing the behavior or increasing it, making it more likely to occur in the future. Uh, so to talk, uh, to talk briefly about that third point or that third principle, it's that challenging behaviors depend on context. Like we said, they don't occur in a vacuum. They happen in a specific context. So when we think about context, we're thinking about what we call both setting events and antecedents. Most of you have probably heard of the terms antecedent behavior and consequence, or the ABC model of behavior, right? An antecedent being time to go to school, behavior being the kid hits the parent, and the consequence being, for example, that the child gets out of going on the bus, for example. Um, but what people, and the ABC model is, is, you know, was a very common and popular model of behavior for a long time, and then what people started realizing around the 90s, maybe even 80s, 80s I would say, um, was that sometimes the same antecedent didn't always lead to the same behavior, which I'm sure most of you know as a parent or a teacher, or a teacher right? Sometimes, how come sometimes you say time to get out of, time to go to school and your child hits you? And then other days you say time to go to school and your child just gets on the bus, right? Why is it different from one day to the next or from one hour to the next? And the reason for that is something we call setting events, um, which is also a similar concept to what many of you might have heard of, motivating operations or establishing operations. Um, and a setting event is basically a broad contextual factor that makes a certain antecedent more or less likely to trigger or evoke a certain behavior. Um, I, that, that can be a little confusing, so I'll break it down. So a setting event, again, could be, it could really be any factor. It could be um, a biological factor or internal factor, like in the example here, fatigue, for example. It can be pain, another biological factor such as pain or illness or anxiety, uh, ear infections, stomach aches. It could be a social setting event, such as being recently teased or bullied, or having a bad day, or um, having been ignored for a really long time, or being reprimanded. It could be um, uh, activity setting events, such as a preferred activity ending, for example. So your favorite TV show ends, and then mom says, time to do, to, do your homework, or time to go to school, right, the antecedent. So a setting event could be any of those things that make the antecedent more likely to trigger that uh, behavior. So in this example, it's fatigue. And this makes sense to you, right? On mornings when your child is tired, it's more likely that the antecedent time to go to school is going to evoke aggression because it makes the demand time to go to school that much more aversive than on days when the child's not fatigued, right? And so it increases the reinforcing value of escaping from getting on the school bus, right? Does that make sense? Um, whereas on days when the child's not tired, it, the antecedent time to go to school is less likely to evoke that problematic behavior. And so the child is more likely to just get on the bus, right? So again, in this example, fatigue is the setting of it. But all of us have these factors operating in our own life, right? If I had a bad day at work, setting event, and then I come home and my husband says, Lauren, you left the dishes in the sink, for example. On an, on an average day, you left the dishes in the sink would not trigger any sort of problematic behavior. But perhaps on a, on a day when I had a really bad day at work, the setting event, maybe the antecedent, more and you left the dishes in the sink, would be much more likely to trigger me being cranky, for example. I'll be honest here. So, um, so and that really shows how setting events and antecedents interact to lead to problematic behaviors in all of our lives. But again, the, the rest of us can often communicate what's going on with us, and individuals with autism or developmental disabilities sometimes can't. So it's really up to us to kind of do this detective work and figure out what are the antecedents, what are the setting events, what are the consequences.
Um, and the good news about looking at behavior in this way, what we call the four-term contingency, thinking about setting events, the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences, is that it gives us these four different levels upon which to intervene, right? We can alter the setting event, we can alter fatigue, uh, we can alter the antecedent, we can embed the demand, for example, in, in a more positive context. We can teach a replacement skill for that behavior, so teach the child to ask, um, ask to be driven to school as, in a, as a first step, or teach the child to say, I don't want to get on the bus, or teach the child to say, I want to take my favorite toy on the bus, for example. Um, or, and we could alter the consequences, so that we're increasing the positive reinforcement for getting on the bus calmly, and we are trying to eliminate the reinforcement for the child getting out of taking the bus, right? Um, so, for example, for one of my kids who wouldn't get on the bus, his parents ended up driving him to school past his favorite farm. So we were trying to eliminate that reinforcement so he's not going past his favorite farm on the way to school. Make sense? So we're really trying to think about, you know, all of those different levels of, of a behavior. And we'll talk about um, more examples of this, okay, as, as we go on. All right, so now that was sort of the basic kind of intro. I'm checking time here. And so now we're going to get a, you know, the, the topic of how to conduct a functional behavior assessment. Honestly, I, I teach whole lectures on for six hours maybe. So this is going to be a very, very brief introduction to it. Um, there's a lot of great resources online on the KIPBS website and some of the other websites you'll see on APBS, Association for Positive Behavior Support. Um, uh, behaviordoctor.org. Many great websites have a lot of information upon this, but I'll try to hit on some of the main points. So how do we conduct a functional behavior assessment or an FBA? How do we try to figure out the function of an individual's behavior? It's not always easy to do so. Sometimes it's very hard to do so, and some studies show that maybe 30% of functional assessments are inconclusive, meaning we don't know what the function is. But, the, but in most instances, you can figure out at least one or more of the functions of an individual's problem behavior. And the way we do that is multiple methods. Um, one of the things we do is interviews. We do interviews with parents or teachers or paraprofessionals or other caretakers, or we do interviews with the individual themselves. Uh, one such interview is the functional assessment interview, or FAI, by Rob O'Neill et al. And you could get um, a free adaptation of that on the KIPBS website. Um, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Then um, direct observation is another method, and that's where you observe the individual and you look at, okay, what happens right before his problematic behavior? What happens before he hits? What happens before he screams? It's the antecedents. And what happens right after he yells or screams? Um, so what is the consequence? Because the consequence can tell you what the function is, right? Both of those things, the antecedents and consequences, can tell you what the function is. Uh, we'll talk more about that. And there's a lot of great checklists and questionnaires you can use. Uh, one of the most popular ones, the Motivation Assessment Scale, the MAS, by Mark Duran and Dan Crimmin. Um, another similar measure that, uh, that has a, a, a little bit of... Uh, of the, some different items um, is the questions about behavioral function, the QABF, that's another measure. Uh, there's also the functional assessment checklist, the facts. Um, there's um, to get at some setting events, you can use the setting event checklist, or there's the contextual assessment inventory, the CAI, which uh, gives you some information about the context, meaning the combination of antecedents under setting events. And then finally, the last method is to conduct an actual functional analysis, which is an actual experiment to verify the function of the behavior in which you are manipulating the consequences for a behavior in a very sort of um, standardized, uh, controlled fashion, or manipulating the antecedents um, to look at the effect on the behavior. Uh, this is possible to do a brief version of this in schools and homes that we have done. It may not always be necessary because sometimes it is very it is very revealing from the interviews and direct observations um, and checklists and questionnaires what the function of behavior is. So it's, it's not always necessary to do a functional analysis. But when in doubt, you may need to actually, you know, manipulate the functions, as in when a child bites himself, in one scenario you respond by providing attention, in another scenario you respond by removing demands, in another scenario you respond by giving intangible items, etc. And you look at whether the frequency of behavior increases or decreases in response to what you do. Um, but that's not going to be the focus today. I'm going to talk more about the other areas because often what parents and teachers are doing in the in the real world without the help of a professional is more um, in one of those first three categories. 
Okay, so some of the questions you might want to ask on the functional assessment interview, and like I said, it, it, there's there's a lot of questions, so I'm not going to go over all of them. You can go check out the FAI uh, for yourself on that website I have right here. But some of the some of the basic things you're trying to get at are first, what is the behavior? And that might sound obvious, but often sometimes I can spend a full hour with a parent or teacher trying to really get at what is the problematic behavior. Let's operationally define the behavior. Sometimes they'll say the problem is he's lazy, or the problem is my child's rude. Right? But what is rude? Rude's not a behavior, rude's an adjective. So we have to actually define what does rude mean? What does rude look like so that a fly on the wall would know if your child was rude? Um, so is rude rolling eyes, rolling his eyes? Is rude cursing, for example? So that's the first thing we want to get at. What is the behavior? What is the most problematic behavior to you? Is it? And again, you want to focus on one thing specifically. I know the tendency, most of my students have this problem, of, you know, the tendency to want to focus on everything at once, to focus on running away and yelling and screaming and hitting and tantruming. But if you do that, you'll probably get overwhelmed and not be able to fix anything. So you might want to list what are all the problematic behaviors and then prioritize the first one you want to focus on. So first, what's our target behavior? Once you isolate or identify the target behavior, then where is your target behavior, where is this behavior most likely and least likely to occur? at home, at school, in the grocery store, et cetera. When is it most likely to occur? In the morning, the afternoon, the evening? With whom is it most um, likely to occur? With mom or dad or teacher or grandma? And then where, when, and with whom is it least likely to occur, right? Is the behavior triggered by any specific events? Um, turning off the TV, for example, or saying do your homework. Are the expectations for this person realistic? Sometimes, uh, you know, um, I once remember mom of a three-year-old was saying, you know, I want him to just sort of sit quietly for 45 minutes while I make dinner. No matter how much work we do, we might not get a three-year-old to be able to sit quietly for 45 minutes because that's probably not a realistic expectation of what a three-year-old can do. So some, some of the questions we're trying to ask get at that. Does the environment provide opportunities for achievement, control, mastery? Again, you know, sometimes people just want an individual with development disabilities to kind of sit quietly in a docile sort of compliant fashion. But we all want to be able to feel like we're doing something meaningful with our time, not just sorting colored blocks or, or something of that sort. We all want to be given a purpose and meaning. So that's a big thing we try to do with our kids, give them some sort of control or choices in their life, help them to feel some sort of success or mastery. Um, does the person know a better way to engage in the behavior, uh, to get their needs met? Um, so again, you know, maybe, like we said before, the person is yelling or screaming to get attention or to get out of a certain task because maybe they don't have a better way to say to the individual, hey, I don't want to do this. This is too hard for me, right? Do, can they perform this, circum this behavior sometimes, the positive behavior sometimes under certain circumstances? If so, under what circumstances? If we see, okay, the child really can sit in his seat and pay attention in social studies, but not in English, we want to say, well, why is that? What's different? Is it something different about what the teacher is doing or something different about the lay layout of the classroom or something maybe a different peer who's sitting next to in one classroom than the other? So again, we want to play a detective here and really try to figure out what is helping the individual to uh, display the target behavior in one context but not in another. And what new skills do we need to teach this person to give them a better way? What are their existing communication skills, academic skills, social skills, etc.? And of course, how can we motivate this person? Um, some of the questions, you know, what really motivates them? And often parents or teachers will say, you know, there's really nothing that motivates them. And one of the questions I often ask is, well, what do they do when, they left, when they're left to their own devices um, or left on their own? That can often give you the clue as to what's really going to motivate them. So these are some of the questions we'll ask. Another question I think I commonly ask is, uh, if, you know, let's say the president was coming over today and you had to get your child to be on his absolute best behavior, what would you do? And that answer is revealing. If a parent says, you know, oh, I would just give him his iPad all day, that probably means the behavior is serving a tangible function to get the iPad, um, or it might mean that. Um, if the parent says, oh, I would just give them nonstop attention all day, that, mu that must mean that attention is probably a very powerful reinforcer and that their challenging behavior may be serving the function of gaining attention. Or if parents were to say, oh, if the president was coming over and I had to get him to behave, I would just leave him alone all day. I would just make sure not to talk to him, just stay out of the room all day. That means that this individual is, pro is, is very likely engaging in a problematic behavior to escape demands or escape social interaction even. So again, this, the questions we ask parents, teachers can really give us um, 
a good idea of the function. And I want to, I usually like to ask multiple informants, um, multiple, you know, both parents, teachers, many people as possible, because again, kids behave differently for different people, I'm sure you all know. And so that can really help reveal why the behavior is occurring in some circumstances, but not others. Okay? So to give you all an example, um, this is just a very, very brief excerpt, excerpt from an interview. If I were to say what, you know, with one family, we said what specific activity is most likely to cause the challenging behavior? For example, this family said having to wait in line at the grocery store. And with whom is it most likely? Having to wait in line at the grocery store with dad. In what settings is it most likely? Specifically, having to wait in line at the grocery store at Trader Joe's. What, what time of day is the challenging behavior most likely? Having to wait in line at the grocery store after school. Then I would ask the parent, how do you respond to the challenging behavior? And they said, we leave the grocery store. And then what is your child's reaction to your response? He calms down after leaving the store. So based on that limited information, and again, you would need more information to really confirm this, but based on that limited information, what would your hypothesis be as to what this child, what function or purpose this child's challenging behavior is serving? I know no one is really going to answer me right now, but I'm giving you a pause to think about it for a minute. So the hypothesis that I would probably most likely make is that his behavior is functioning to escape the grocery store, to escape or avoid or get out of the grocery store, negative reinforcement, right? And the evidence for that is the consequence that when that how the parents respond to the problem behavior is they take him out of the grocery store. That's how we're able to know what the function or purpose is by what is the most typical consequence, what is the most common consequence. Because what he's getting out of it is what's happening right after the behavior, right? And what setting events um, and antecedents do you think might be at play here, might be contributing to his problematic behavior? Uh, one of the, you know, one of them, it, it, obviously it seems to happen more with his dad. Trader Joe's might be a, have some sort of specific antecedents associated with it, whether it's certain lighting or certain song that's maybe playing when the child goes. A very likely setting event for this child could be crowds, because Trader Joe's is more crowded when you go right after school. So these are some setting events we might want to explore. Another setting of it might be fatigue. Maybe the child's more tired or hungry after a full day at school. So these are some of the setting events you might want to look at in this scenario. Okay? And just to give you kind of more information, even if you're not asking all the structured questions on an FAI, again, sometimes the, the disadvantage of interviews, I will say, is that the interview is only as good as the reporter. I've had many, and same thing with the questionnaires such as the MAS, I've had many a family, a parent or teacher say, oh no, I don't pay attention after my child does this, or no, I don't let, I, I don't remove the demand after he does this. And then when you do a direct observation, you realize that is what the parent or teacher is doing. And it doesn't mean that they're lying, often they're not aware of what they're doing. Now that I'm a parent myself, <laughs> I frequently realize how I'm not always aware of what I'm doing. And I thought I, of all people, would be, but I'm not always aware of uh, my reaction to a behavior or my my antecedents even. So I think, you know, sometimes we're not always the accurate reporter of our own behavior. It's really hard to be living life and observing it at the same time. So interviews sometimes could be inaccurate for that reason, which is why direct observation is so important. So what you can see here is um, when I'm doing individual work with Val, she does very well. When I move on to work with other children, she becomes disruptive and may strike another child. Also, I noticed that when the speech pathologist comes in to talk to me or observe the class, Val puts on quite a show. She'll spit or swear or grab things off the table and throw them. When she's acting like this, we'll lay down the law and tell her that we won't allow this kind of thing in our classroom and that she'd better start to act more like a young lady. So, given that brief excerpt from an interview, and off, of course you'd want more information, what might a reasonable hypothesis be about what the function of Val's behavior is? And Val's, let me be clear, Val's disruptive behavior or aggressive behavior, striking another child, or spitting or swearing, because they all serve the same, the same, serve the same function in this case. So based on the information, it really seems like the most likely function of Val's behavior is to obtain attention from her teacher. 
in particular, um, it seems like a very common setting event, like, like they said, is when a speech pathologist comes in. So it could be, because again, we see this a lot with all our kids. Again, they're not always engaging with attention-seeking behavior. It might They might only start to do that when their parent or teacher is talking to another adult, for example, or when their parent or teacher is paying attention to a sibling or another peer. So again, knowing what the specific antecedents or triggers are will, will help us know how to prevent it and know how to intervene. As another example, um, when, so again, you know, just without even doing a direct observation, just on the brief anecdote, you have a pretty good sense of what the most likely function is for this individual. As another example, when we're having break time, Jim's quiet and happy, but when I ask him to go back to work, he yells and pushes me out of the way. When we're doing physical exercises, I never get through more than one or two sit-ups before Jim runs away. If I ask him to come back, he tries to kick me. Uh, so in this example, uh, the function of Jim's behavior is most likely what? It's to escape folding laundry. Or with Jim, it, it's most likely to escape any sort of physical or gross motor activities, such as physical exercise, folding laundry. He may not display that same problematic behavior when the task is something uh, that can be more sedentary or require less physical or gross motor activity. So that's some examples of interviews. Then there's also, like I said, direct observation. And there's something called the functional assessment observation form you can use online. Um, you can just Google that and you'll find it. There's observation cards you can find on the Vanderbilt website or um, context cards in, in Ted Carr's communication-based um, intervention book. But one of the easiest things you can also use is just an ABC chart or scatter plot. I'll show you examples of both of those. An ABC chart is just what it sounds, three columns, antecedent, behavior, consequence. So you go to a school or you watch in your home and you observe, okay, what happens right before my child hits, the antecedent, and what happens right after my child hits, the consequence, okay? And then a scatter plot, I'll show you an example of that. Here's a scatter plot. This is basically where you just tally up the times of day um, that the problematic behavior, in this case it's disrupting class with inappropriate comments, that you tally up where the problematic behavior is most likely to occur. So based on this information, um, you can see the problematic behavior seems to be more likely to occur middle of the week, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, right? It seems more likely to occur in the morning, but it also seems in particular more likely to occur during math and English. It seems to be really related to the academic subject, okay? So if you were gonna, if you were gonna go conduct as a school psychologist or as a parent or as a teacher, if you were gonna go conduct a functional behavior assessment to figure out an, an, a functional assessment observation to figure out um, what the function is, when would you want to go observe? I get a lot of different answers to this question. Usually people tell me during math or English, which is very true. I would definitely want to see math or English to figure out what was triggering the problem behavior. But I would also want to see, I would also make sure I want to observe science or social studies. So as you can see, there's no problematic behavior during occurring during lunch or health or art. Maybe that's because it's the afternoon, but more likely it's probably because those are not academic subjects. Those are more uh, less intense um, academically, uh, less academically demanding. But science and social studies are academic subjects too, yet there's not nearly as much problem behavior in those two classes. So what I would want to see is observe math and science on one day, and then observe maybe social studies and English on the other day to see, again, what is different. Because again, then you could see, is it something about the teacher's style? Does one teacher reprimand more? Does one teacher attend to the disruptive comments more? Is it is does one teacher have a pace that's more rapid than the other? Or is it peers? Is the child sitting next to peers that maybe talk to them or are more disruptive or laugh when they make jokes? Or is it something about the layout of that classroom? Is the child sitting close to the teacher in one class and farther in another? Or close to the window in one classroom and not in the other? Um, so these are all the kind of factors you really want to look at to figure out why is it happening in math and English but not in science and social studies. So again, this can be very useful to scatter plot. Then there's the ABC chart. And just to give you guys, again, we write down just what happens right before, what happens right after it. So uh, first example, and these are, these are uh, this is one of my real kids. A mother's on the phone, not talking to Eddie. Eddie yells, this is not the real child's name, I should add, <laughs> changed his name. Eddie yells, mother says, Eddie, I'm on the phone. So in this instance, what might you hypothesize the function of his behavior is? Yeah, I would hypothesize that the function is probably to get mom's attention, right? 
Mom's on the phone not talking to him. And then as soon as Eddie yells, Mom immediately gives him uh, the consequence of attention. Eddie, I'm on the phone. That's attention. Even if it's a brief, even if it was just Eddie, or even if it was just looking at him, that might be enough attention to make Eddie more likely to continue yelling in the future every time Mom's on the phone. Okay. Next example, and again, these are two real-life examples actually taken from the same kid that were back-to-back. -back. So um, Mother asks Eddie to do math homework. Eddie yells. Uh, mother stops interacting with Eddie and leaves him alone. So mom walks out of the room, right? So again, this was the same kid, but in this example, the function of Eddie's behavior, and interestingly, mom had written at the time, mom wrote that the function was attention, which is, that, which is why she walked away and left him alone. But you can only really judge what the function is, not based on what you think the child wants, but based on what is the most common consequence. And a lot of ABC data really showed that every time Eddie yells, mom is much more likely to leave the room, and leave him alone. Which means that, again, his yelling is serving the function or purpose of not having to do his math homework. Mom withdraws her demand. Mom leaves. Okay. Next example. Uh, and again, this shows you that the same behavior of yelling could serve different functions um, in the presence of different antecedents or in different contexts. Okay. Um, next, uh, next instance, five minutes before dinner, Tom's mother walks into the kitchen. That's the antecedent behavior, Tom walks into the kitchen and starts crying and screaming. Um, consequence, Tom's mother immediately gives him one of his favorite foods. So in that example, um, the, the, the function of his behavior is, to, is tangible to obtain access to a favorite food. And the antecedent is, again, that it's dinner time and he's hungry. A possible setting event could be that maybe he ate a small meal earlier that day, so he was more hungry than usual, right? Last example, and this is the hardest. This one people often have trouble with. Um, antecedent, going to the library. Mom says, let's go inside. Behavior, Jen screams, kicks, and drops to the floor. Consequence, mom picks Jen up and carries her into the library. What is the most likely function? Again, you would want to see this behavior pattern repeated, but assuming this was repeated, what would the most likely function of Jen's behavior be? Think about it for a moment. So most people usually say that almost every time I give this talk, most people say that the function of Jen's behavior is to escape going to the library. And they say that because when mom says, let's go inside the library, she screams, kicks, and drops to the floor. But when you're trying to figure out what the function of behavior is, the antecedents matter, the, of course, like in the previous examples, but you really want to pay attention to what is the consequence, right? So the consequence is not Mom picks up Jen and takes her into the car and they go home. If that was the consequence, then yes, the function of her behavior would most likely be to escape going to the library. But that's not the consequence here. The consequence is that mom picks Jen up and carries her into the library. So that means she's not escaping going to the library, right? So again, you don't want to judge the function based on what you think Jen likes or doesn't like based on, oh, you know, when we say let's go to the library, she screams, kicks, yells, that must mean she doesn't like the library. You want to judge what is the function based on what is the most common consequence. What is Jen getting out of it? And what it seems is that mom picks her up and carries her into the library. So the behavior might be serving the function of attention or physical affection from mom, getting mom to pick Jen up. That seems to be, again, what, what the most likely function of Jen's behavior is in this instance. Okay? All right. Let me briefly say here, here's just an example of a questionnaire you could also use, the motivation assessment scale, whereas, like I said, when you're answering certain questions, you can score it up and it'll give you um, the most likely, um, the rankings of what the most likely and least likely functions are. I'm going to skip over in the interest of time, though, because I don't have so much time left. Um, some common antecedents you might observe, and again, the antecedents could be very, very specific to a kid. Uh, like for one of my kids, the antecedent was just, you know, another kid crying, for example, or another kid saying a certain word. Um, but the most common antecedents you typically tend to see in school settings, at least, is specific assignments. Homework is one of the most common antecedents. Being teased or being told no is one of the most common antecedents for my kids. Uh, frustration or failure on a task. Um, that's, that's really not as operationally defined and I was, as I would like, but um, not being, uh, it's, it's being given a specific task that really um, is too difficult for the child, that the child doesn't have the skills to do. Often I will see, you know, um, a behavior plan of a school for like, let's say, a kid who's struggling during reading where the intervention is they give the kid a reward trip for reading tasks. That's all well and good, 
but that's assuming the problem's motivation. If the child's really struggling with reading and reading too, is too hard for them, a reward chart's probably not going to help them too much. Um, interruptions is another comment, especially interrupting a preferred activity. Waiting is a big trigger for a lot of our kids. Delaying gratification, we call that. Um, boring or tedious or, or um, tasks are common. Transitions is a very, very common. Um, a common antecedent for our kids. Um, I'm not going to go over all of these. You have these. Here's also some example setting events. I'm not going to go over all of these because you have them in the handouts, but like I said, some common physical or biological ones are fatigue or illness or medication side effects or pain or illness. Um, one of the seminal studies by my late advisor uh, really showed that menstrual pain was a setting event for problem behavior in women with autism and other developmental disabilities, um, women in a residential home. So when the women were told, you know, make your bed or brush your teeth, that demand alone didn't trigger problem behavior. And menstrual pain alone didn't trigger problem behavior. But it was the combination of menstrual pain plus being told, make your bed or, or brush your teeth, that really evoked the problem behavior. Um, other and other setting events on here, like we said, um, could be a, a routine being disrupted or absence of a preferred caregiver or teacher, for example. Okay. All right. Um, and so once you have all this information from your questionnaires, your interviews, your direct observation, you really want to try to come up with a brief sort of hypothesis, such as this nice, nice example. Um, Sam engages in disruptive behavior, and of course you want to define what the specific disruptive behaviors are for him when asked to complete independent seat work, there's the antecedent, because when he does, he avoids or escapes having to complete the work. That's the function, avoiding or escaping the work. This is more likely to happen during afternoon classes, that's a setting event, particularly when he hasn't slept well the previous night. Fatigue, that's another setting event, okay? So once you have all this information, you want to come up with a few, one or two or three very clear hypothesis statements about what the function or functions or antecedent or antecedents or setting events are that contribute to this behavior in a very clear fashion that everyone can agree on. Okay. Once you have that information, you, you then you move on to intervention. Okay. The reason we went over that, like we said, all of that, is because the main idea in, in ABA and positive behavior support really is that applied behavior analysis, I'm sorry, ABA, or positive behavior support, PBS, is that assessment really has to be linked to treatment. However you decide to treat or address this behavior should be based on the data you get from your functional behavior assessment, okay? So again, if you were to just say to me, hey, my kid's biting, what do I do? Or my kid's hitting, what do I do? I wouldn't really know how to advise you because your kid could be hitting to gain attention or to get out of doing homework or to um, escape a fine motor task or escape a gross motor task, we would really want to try to figure out what are the specific factors contributing to that behavior. And that way we'll know how to intervene. So again, assessments linked to treatment, that's the key idea. Then we want to develop prevention strategies to alter the antecedents or setting events to make the problem behavior less likely to occur. We want to develop replacement strategies, which means teaching the individual an appropriate replacement behavior or skill to replace the problematic behavior. That could include communication skills, coping or relaxation skills, academic skills, daily living skills or chores or tasks, problem solving skills, social skills, uh, the list goes on and on. Those are some examples of skills we might want to teach. And then finally, there's response or consequence strategies. Uh, some Mark Duran refers to as management strategies, but it all means the same thing. So again, altering the consequence that occurs after the behavior to make it less likely to occur. So the consequence strategies we use are positive reinforcement, positively reinforcing the replacement strategies, extinction, which means not reinforcing the problem behavior anymore, not reinforcing the challenging behavior, or differential reinforcement, which basically means differentially reinforcing or giving more reinforcement for the problematic behaviors, uh, I'm sorry, giving more reinforcement for the absence of problematic behaviors or for replacements for problematic behaviors than for the problem behavior. And typically, you want to combine these strategies to really make them more effective in a multi-component intervention plan. So um, one, of the main, so one of the main prevention strategies you really want to use is, in, um, is increasing predictability because tons of studies, a wonderful study in particular by uh, Flannery and Horner in 94, really showed that problem behavior is more likely to occur um, when situations are unpredictable or unsignaled 
versus than when they are predictable or signaled, meaning when you provide the information, the individual with information about an upcoming task or event. Right? And that's why we all have Google calendars or agenda books so that we, you know, I might know what I have that day, but I still like to look at my Google calendar to really see it. And individuals with autism and de developmental disabilities are no different. So one way you could increase predictability is with a visual schedule to really help the individual to know what's coming next. It could be a long schedule or it could be something as simple as a first then card, first you potty, then you do this, first you do your homework, then your TV show, to just let them know when something is going to come, when they, when they will be able to get a preferred activity or finish a non-preferred activity, et cetera. Another great strategy to increase predictability is timers or countdowns, what we call advanced warnings. Um, recently, uh, I'm in New York City, I know a lot of you are you know, in other countries even, but in New York City they recently installed something in the subway system here, um, the little timers or clocks to tell you uh, next train will be coming in five minutes or ten minutes or, or whatever. I remember when they first did that I thought to myself, this seems like a waste of money, what's the point of this? That, that knowing the next train's coming in ten minutes isn't helping the next train come, it's not helping me get there any quicker. But the longer, the longer, <laughs> the longer the time passed, the longer I got used to it, I realized that really um, the purpose of it was to reduce anxiety, was to kind of calm us down and increase predictability and let us know when the next train's coming. And it did make me feel calmer to know, okay, the next train will be coming in five minutes versus to have no idea when it would be coming, if it would be two minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And it's the same with our kids. There are some kids who timers can make them more anxious, but for mo many or most of my kids, I would say advanced warnings, knowing how much longer they have to do a non-preferred activity or knowing how long they have left to do a preferred activity so that it's not an abrupt ending really helps them um, with transitions. Um, again, it provides a greater sense of control. Um, you could just use a regular egg timer, a regular kitchen timer, digital, or you could use something a little fancier like the time timer over there, um, the second to the left picture where you see the amount of red running out, or the time tracker, the thing on the end on the right where you see it changing from green to yellow to red to let the individual know how much time they have left. So again, just ways to make it more predictable. Advanced warnings to you have five minutes left of your of uh, of your of My Little Pony. You have four minutes left of My Little Pony. Two minutes left to one middle My Little Pony. One minute left to one Little Pony. Five, four, three, two, one. My Little Pony's finished. Right. So just advanced warnings to again help the individual to alert what's coming. Priming is another great way, and that basically means previewing or rehearsing. One of the first studies done on this by the Kegels in 92 um, showed that for an individual who was having difficulty, for example, during class-wide story time, what they did was they had the parents read him the same story the night before on a one-on-one -on -one relaxed sort of condition so that the story was more predictable. So that's an example of priming. We use priming with everything for kids, for my kids who have difficulty with. The grocery store, for example, will rehearse at home. Um, the checkout line with a fake cash register at home. Uh, another way you can uh, use priming is with video priming, um, where, uh, for example, um, the study that was done on this by Laura Schreiman really showed that, um, so for individuals having transition difficulty transitioning in the mall, they basically did a bird's eye view, a video camera, videotaping the transition from one store to the other store to the other store. So with no people in it, that's video modeling, Video priming is just a bird's eye view of what the transition looks like, basically. So it's as if the individual is transitioning or progressing through the transition. And I've used this successfully with my kids who have difficulty transitioning from one classroom to another, for example. So video priming can be another great prevention strategy to use um, to reduce, um, again, the aversiveness of for those kids for whom transitions or any unpredictable changes or events can be um, antecedents that evoke their problematic behavior. Social stories can be another good way, again, of just making things more predictable. Um, a recent uh, meta-analysis by Kokina and Kern actually showed that social stories, um, you know, there was mixed effectiveness, but there was actually more, social stories were more effective for reducing inappropriate behaviors than they were for teaching social skills. So, and I do frequently use social stories to address inappropriate behaviors. Writing stories about, again, um, so if the individual is having difficulty in the grocery store, writing a story about what's expected of him at the grocery store, making it more predictable, what behaviors he can engage in when he's in the grocery store, and what rewards he will receive when we leave the grocery store, contingent upon appropriate behavior. Providing choices is another great prevention strategy. Tons of studies have shown that individuals um, that um, 
again, uh, you know, individuals a lot more. This is a particularly powerful strategy for um, escape motivated problem behavior, for behavior that serves um, to escape certain aversive uh, task demands, for example. And the choices you want to give are not like you can do your homework or you cannot do your homework. That's not what I'm talking about. But you can always find a way to incorporate choice in anything. So do you want to do your homework with mom or dad? Do you want to do your homework at the kitchen table or the living room table? Do you want to do your homework with your monkey pencil or with your SpongeBob pen? Do you want to do your homework in this Star Wars notebook or in uh, <laughs> this other notebook? You get the gist of what I'm saying. Um, so again, you want to really try to incorporate. Do you want to sit in this special chair or this special chair? Do you want to wear this hat or this hat to do your homework? You can always find choices to give the individual, and that will really enhance their sense of control over the environment because, again, Everybody wants to feel like an active participant in their own life. Often individuals with developmental disabilities are really told what to do all day and given very little choice or control. So you will always get kind of more buy-in or more investment, um, more, more engagement within. So again, st studies have shown that providing choices does increase task engagement and reduce escape-motivated problem behavior. And you can do that for even individuals who can't talk. They can choose non-verbally with a choice board, like the things that are pictured here. Embedding um, is another prevention strategy. So for an individual who hates making their bed, you can embed, okay, finish making your bed within the positive context of talking about going to the mall, for example. Another example of embedding would be if an individual has difficulty with division problems but is successful at multiplication problems, you would not want to give 10 division problems but would give maybe three division problems interspersed with, uh, within 10 multiplication problems. Okay, so that's an example of embedding something that's difficult amongst more preferred or easier tasks. Uh, and incorporating perseverative interests is another great prevention strategy. You can use perseverative interests as a reward, but you can also just incorporate the, their perseverative or, per, or um, obsessive interest into the activity itself. So for example, for an individual who hates uh, math but who loves Legos, you could um, make their Lego, uh, their math assignments, um, you incorporating Legos into their math assignments. Or uh, um, Ben Barry and Kern in their book give the great example of handwriting book exercises replaced with copying instructions from preferred video games bonus points booklet. Okay, I'm going to skip over generalized reinforcement in the interest of time. That basically means pairing an aversive person or activity or situation with highly preferred positive reinforces, non-contingently. So, if the, like, so for example, if, if an individual dislikes a specific staff member, you could pair that staff member with the individual's favorite things. Um, essentially, that, that's the short version. Okay, so those are some prevention strategies. Prevention strategies are great and are very important, but um, you don't want to overly rely on them. Mark Duran's research really shows that a lot of teachers and parents tend to over-rely on prevention strategies in the absence of teaching skills. So they may, may tend to avoid difficult situations instead of teaching more appropriate ways to cope with that situation. So prevention strategies are really great in the short term, but you often want to fade them out. Not, not all of them, like it's okay to have maybe a visual schedule your whole life, like we all maybe use this um, Google Calendar, for example, or agenda books. Um, but you want to also be mindful of the fact that you don't want to always be avoiding difficult situations, but want to actively be teaching individual skills. Because you can't just remove a behavior that's serving a purpose without replacing it with, with a more appropriate alternative. You want to give the individual an, another way to get their need met in a better way, basically. And like we said, that can involve communication skills, social skills, any sort of skills. The most popular and most effective and well-researched uh, strategy for teaching replacement skills is communication skills, and that would be called functional communication training. And the first study on that was done by uh, my late advisor, Tech Carr, Mark Durand in 85, brilliant study where they, um, they looked at the problematic behaviors of children in a classroom, for example, and some of the kids, some of the kids whose behavior was functioning to gain the teacher's attention, they taught them to say, am I doing good work? as a more appropriate way to get the teacher's attention. And for other kids whose behavior was functioning to escape the teacher's attention, they taught them to say, I want a break, for example, to escape in a more appropriate way. Okay, so that, and again, this dramatically reduced the kid's problem behavior. So functional communication training doesn't just mean teaching any communication skill, it means teaching a skill, a communication skill that serves the same purpose as the individual's problematic behavior. I can't emphasize the point enough. I can't tell you how many classrooms I've been in where they teach all the kids to ask for a break, 
that's only going to be useful if the kid is motivated by the break, if the function of the behavior is to get a break. If it's a kid who wants attention or a tangible item or sensory stimulation, teaching them to ask for a break is not going to be very helpful, most likely. Okay. So if the function is to attention, you could teach the individual to ask, like we said, for social interaction or attention or praise. Am I doing good work? Play with me. Look at me. Look at that all of those sorts of phrases. If it's escape, you could teach an individual to ask for help or ask for a break, for example. Um, if it's for tangible, you could teach them to ask for the preferred item or activity. And of course, you should match this to the individual's language level. You could teach them to say, I want the iPad or just iPad. Or if it's for an individual who has no language, they could communicate through an augmentative communication device or through a picture communication, pointing to a picture of what they want. And for sensories, um, you could ask, teach an individual to ask for items that provide sensory stimulation or privacy so that they can engage in a specific sensory uh, related behavior. You could also teach an individual coping skills such as deep breathing or progressive muscle relaxation. For some individuals I work with, we teach them coping self statements such as, I can be brave or I can do this or I can fight my anxiety. A mom will be so proud of me when I uh, brush my teeth with this toothpaste <laughs> for a kid who was scared of toothpaste. Um, those sorts of things. Um, another great re important replacement skill is teaching um, waiting, or what we call tolerance for delay of reinforcement. Because when um, an important point I should mention is that when you are first teaching individual communication skills, so for example, when you're first teaching them to say, I want a break, you want to honor that communication immediately, consistently, right away. So as soon as the individual asks for a break, you give it to them every time they ask for it, right? Because if you don't, they'll still resort to their problem behavior because they'll realize their problematic behavior is a more effective way to get a break. If you only occasionally give them a break when they say break, but they always get a break when they hit or yell or scream, they're going to resort to their problem behavior, right? So you, al you always want to honor their appropriate communication request. However, you can't do that the rest of your life or their life, not helpful. So over time, after the, when, once the individual can successfully use their communication skill, that's when you want to teach the lot tolerance for delayed reinforcement by delaying the reinforcement. So at first, every time they ask for a break, you give it to them. But then after, let's say, several weeks of success when the intervention, when they can successfully communicate, then you might want to say, okay, finish this one math problem, then you can take the break. And then, okay, finish these two math problems, then you can take the break. Then the next day, finish these three math problems, then you can take a break. So you are gradually delaying reinforcement more and more and more. Okay? And there's other ways to uh, thin a schedule of reinforcement too, but, but we, we don't have time to talk about that today. All right, um, in terms of consequence strategies, I mentioned this, there's basically reinforcement, which is any consequence that increases a behavior, punishment, any consequence that decreases a behavior. Um, we, don't really use, we don't use punishment as part of positive behavior support, so I'm not really going to talk about that today, but punishment is a strategy that can be successfully used, um, but you may not need to resort to that because frequently I can, we, we are able to change behaviors just relying on reinforcement and extinction and differential reinforcement without without resorting to punishment. Um, and then extinction is basically any consequence, um, uh, the lack of any consequence following behavior. So again, when you know the individual's behavior is not serving that function anymore. So if every time, let me, um, so if every time an individual tantrums, you say, stop tantruming, and that's positive reinforcement in the form of attention, extinction would mean that whenever they tantrum, you don't say, stop tantruming anymore. You withdraw your reinforcement. Okay. So one one important thing I want to say about positive reinforcement is that often people will say to me, positive reinforcement doesn't work. And by definition, positive reinforcement has to work because reinforcement is anything that increases a behavior. And something is increasing that kid's behavior, right? It just means that the reinforcers you're trying to use are not what's motivating the kid. Often it could be something like M&Ms or maybe tokens. And maybe it's just something the kid doesn't care about. I can't tell you how many people use a sticker chart with kids, but the stickers don't even count towards anything, and the, the kid could care less if they're getting stickers or not, right? So in that instance, they're trying to use rewards that are simply not motivating to the individual. So um, you could see the great website Behavior Doctor for more ideas, but you know, really the, the, the reinforced use is going to be a lot more effective if it's matched to the function of the individual's behavior. So if this is an individual who's motivated by the teacher's attention, 
then you know probably doesn't make sense to have them earning M and M's. I mean, maybe they would like M and M's, but probably. So for my kid who was a uh, you know uh, ro spreading peanut butter and milk all over the classroom and rolling in it and doing that for the teacher and peers' attention, um, for him the most effective reward was getting to tell a joke to the class at the end of each period and gradually feeding it to the end of each day. We're getting to tell a one-minute story to the class, right? So he was able to obtain attention from his class, but for pods contingent upon positive behaviors rather than his problem behaviors. Likewise, if a kid's more motivated by escape, for some of my kids, the most, they don't care about any uh, telling jokes or praise or uh, even M&Ms or computer time. What they really care about for one of my kids, all he really cared about was getting out of music class half an hour early once a week, right? That was his most motivating reward. And obviously we fade that out over time so that he's not always getting out of music class. You really want to think about what's going to be motivating for your kid. In line with that, sometimes you may need to use the individual's perseverative interests as a reinforcer. For one of my individuals whose perseverative or obsessive interest with, with autism was talking about seizures, that's what we used as the reward to motivate the individual to attend school. Okay, whenever you get in the car to go to school, we will talk to you about seizures in the car. Sometimes parents say, isn't that encouraging it? Well, the individual is doing it anyway, right? So let's take that obsessive interest and use it to our advantage. Let's capitalize upon it and use it as something to motivate the individual to engage in appropriate behaviors. And a word about extinction, like I said, it's removing, um, removing reinforcement, basically, from a previously reinforced behavior. Um, let me skip because we are almost out of time. The one point I want to make about extinction is sometimes people think it's the same thing as ignoring, but extinction is only ignoring if the function of the person's behavior is to gain attention. In that case, you're not providing attention anymore, which is ignoring. But let's say the function of the behavior, for example, the individual bangs his head to get a toy. In that instance, extinction is when he bangs his head, you don't give him a toy. Or let's say one of my kids would tantrum so that his mom would stop running errands and they would turn around and go home, right? In that interest, extinction would be not turning around and going home. Keep going on your errand, right? So extinction just means you're no longer reinforcing the problem behavior. This is the hardest part of any intervention, honestly. It's where things most often go wrong because the effects of intervention, the effects of um, extinction initially are that the behavior increases before it gets better. Just like if you were used to getting your candy every time you put money in your vending machine and one day you didn't get it, you'd probably hit the machine, kick the machine because you'd say, hey, where's my reinforcer, right? That's what our kids are doing. They're used to getting reinforced and then they're not. So there's going to be that extinction burst, which is really hard for families and teachers to make it through sometimes. Um, we try to explain that it will get better. You know, um, if you continue to not reinforce the behavior, if you continue to put an extinction, it will eventually get better. But sometimes we're able to help our families who can't do extinction to be successful anyway, even without extinction, by just making sure they're still providing more reinforcement for the positive behaviors than for the inappropriate behaviors, right? Basically, whatever behaviors are getting the most reinforcement are what are going to continue, okay? All right, so let me see. Oh, I have five minutes, I think. So I'll just give a brief overview of the putting it all together. Um, you have these slides in your hands out, so I don't need to go into them in detail. But an example of how you put this all together, a great example from an article by Rob Horner and Hekar, is let's say the setting event for a kid was the amount of time since the toy was last played with, and the antecedent is the toys are currently out of reach, the behavior she bangs her head, and the consequences mom gives her her toys. In a multi-component intervention, you would alter each one of those components. So you would alter the setting event by making sure she has regularly scheduled playtime with her preferred toys, so there's not a large amount of time since the toy was last played with. You want to alter the antecedent by making sure the toys are within her reach versus out of her reach, right? You might want to alter the behavior by teaching her a replacement for the behavior, so teaching her to request the toy, either saying toy or pointing to a picture of toy or I want toy, whatever, depending on what her language level is, right? And then you, of course, alter the consequence in that if she appropriately requests the toy, give her the toy right away immediately every time. But if she bangs her head, do not give her the toy. Extinction. And again, that's, that part is the hardest part, in my opinion. But again, working together using this multi-component intervention, you may even eliminate the need for extinction if you can have enough um, prevention and replacement strategies sometimes, and positive reinforcement, you often don't even need the extinction component. Okay. So, all right, so putting it all together, um, 
I don't think I'll have time to go through all the putting all together slides, but you have these. So let's say the example intervention of the function is to gain attention. Uh, for one of my kids, um, for example, who punched his uh, father's head every day um, when his father would come home from work, it was determined that the function of his behavior was to get his dad's attention. So in that instance, what we did was just schedule playtime with dad. We, it was a very, it was one of the most successful simple interventions we've done in that we just made a visual schedule of get home from school and we put playtime with dad from 6 to 6.30 right on there. So to make it more predictable, he knew when he was going to get it every day, right? So we were able to schedule attention or, for example, for some of my kids who engage in tantrums when their mom's on the phone, you might want to assign an easier or highly preferred activity when their mom's on the phone. Set a timer, say mom's going to be on the phone in five minutes, you draw here while mom's on the phone. As soon as mom gets off the phone, you and mom will play a game together. Right? Those are some examples. You would want to teach the kid, like we said, replacement replacement skills to get attention, such as am I doing good work, like in the study by Karin Durand, or hey, play with me, or what's up. And you want to alter the response or consequence so that you are um, not reinforcing the inappropriate attention getting behavior, such as yelling or screaming or calling out or animal noises, but you're providing a lot of attention for the appropriate attention getting behaviors. Okay? And uh, am I out of time? Oh, let me just do... Uh, I'll just do tangible really quick. I think I have time. Um, so prevention strategy um, for gaining a preferred item or activity um, would be providing an advance warning that the act activity will end soon, for example. So saying, okay, you know, for an individual who tantrums every time their favorite TV show's over, you would say, okay, you have five minutes left to your TV show's over, four minutes left, three minutes left, et cetera. You might even need... Um, transition activity. Um, most of you guys who have preschoolers have probably heard of the clean up song like clean up, clean up, everybody do your share. That's an example of a transition activity um, that everybody uses to help kids do something that they often don't like to do such as clean up. I'm not going to go over the rest of these in the entrance of time but basically the purpose of these slides is to show you how you can have individual prevention, replacement and response strategies that are tailored to each specific function. Escaping demand, we went over a lot of these. Um, I'll just briefly hit upon um, such as if an individual is having difficulty with handwriting and that's the antecedent to their problem behavior, you might want to ask yourself, does this individual need to handwrite? Can they type instead of doing handwriting? Um, will that serve the same purpose and be easier for that individual? So why not do that? Or embedding, like we said, something difficult, like division within the context of multiplication problems or including the child's preferences or interests in the activity. So for an individual who hated math homework but uh, loved starfish, putting pictures of starfish on all of his math homework, or one of my kids loved the Wiggles so we incorporated all of his math problems to include the names of Wiggles characters, for example, or offering choices between those dislike tests. So those are great antecedent strategies for escaping um, or, of course, as we talked about, teaching the individual to ask for help or ask for a break. All right, and I'm gonna. And anxiety is a, is a whole another topic that I think I'll be giving a talk on in a few months. So, so we'll put that off for them. But these are some example strategies for anxiety, which is similar to how you treat escape demand, but some differences in that you'd really want a lot more exposure to the anxiety-provoking situation, and sometimes counter-conditioning or pairing the anxiety-provoking situation with something highly positive. Okay. Um, and sensory, of course, you just want to teach um, an alt, uh, a, a behavior that serves the same sensory need. So if a child is biting his fingers for sensory stimulation, you might want to teach them to chew gum or licorice, for example, instead, and reinforce them for a physically incompatible behavior, what we call differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior. So again, these are just some examples of how the intervention strategies you're choosing um, should really be based on the unique antecedents and consequences that are related to the, the problematic behavior, okay? And how well has positive behavior support succeeded? Pretty well. Um, between a half to two-thirds of individuals show at least an 80 to 90 percent reduction in challenging behaviors. And we do know that treatments based on functional assessment are about twice as likely to be successful as those that aren't, which is why it's so important to conduct a thorough functional behavior assessment. Okay, and I think that's it. I think that take-home behavior is just you really need to know, you know, to think about your kid's behavior instead of just saying, oh, I wish they wouldn't do that. Think about, okay, he's anxious and he doesn't know how to calm himself, or he's frustrated or bored and can't communicate, or he wants attention and doesn't know how else to get it. So once you think about behavior in that way, it'll help you figure out, okay, how can we teach the child to help him get his needs met in a better way, okay? All right, there's some hope, uh, websites that you can all refer to if you would like. Some really great books that I, I recommend on, on positive behavior support and dealing with these challenging behaviors. They're basically review a lot of the points I've said.
And I would like to thank um, um, a lot of the people who really mentored me over the years, Ted Carr, Mark Duran, Darlene McLaughlin, Jen Barconi, uh, Jamie Blyweiss. Um, all right, thank you. And any, any questions? One of the common themes in the questions, Lauren, is about self-injury and biting mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So, yeah. so in particular, a lot of the parents are just saying it's, it's just so challenging. It's challenging yeah. to assess it. It's challenging to extinct it because of the nature of it. So do you have any insight about experiences you've had with that? Well, I do think you're right. I think, again, like, I, like I've told you, Denise, now that I have a child, I, I honestly always think to myself, my God, I, I, if she was biting herself or doing, I, I, don't, I don't think I could ignore it if, let's say, the function of it was to gain attention. It's very hard not to respond when you see your child injuring himself and making himself bleed. So I do think extinction, you're right, is probably the hardest component um, when it comes to a behavior plan. But like, like I said, you might not know, you always need to rely on extinction. So for example, for the individual who was punching his father in the head who I talked about before, let's suppose that was self-injury. Either way, just by giving him a visual schedule, it was, I mean, usually it's not that simple, but his aggression towards his dad just stopped. So if you're able to figure out what is the function of this kid's behavior by teaching him another way to get his need met or by implementing some prevention strategies like a visual schedule, you might eliminate the need for that self-injury so that you never really have to put it on extinction, if, if that makes sense. Um, I think other things you can do are blocking and redirecting. It's, it's not to say you ever want to ignore it completely. Um, when we talk about ignoring, I think I also like to just try to clarify, we're never ignoring the child, we're ignoring the behavior. So if one of my kids started biting his hand I would, and I was talking to him, I wouldn't abruptly stop talking to him because then it would be obvious that I was changing my behavior. Extinction really means you want the behavior to, to have very little effect on its environment in any way. So if an individual is biting himself, I would probably put down his hand, block, redirect in that instance as an immediate response strategy in that moment, but without trying to call obvious attention to the fact that he's doing it. I would certainly not say like, no biting, don't bite your hand, or anything like that to call attention to it. Um, but I would very try to redirect it, um, block it and redirect it um, with something else. But like I said, it's a very kind of short-term crisis management strategy. Your best bet is to really figure out what function it is serving. Sometimes it is hard to figure out just by observing the antecedents and consequences, and sometimes there really could be a medical reason. For one individual, Ted always talked about, who was banging his head into the wall so that it bled for months, functional assessments were really inconclusive, and eventually they were able to figure out this individuals suffering from migraines. And so banging his head in the wall really helped reduce the pain from the migraine. So when you are not able to figure out what the function is from a functional behavior assessment, you might really want to look into biological or medical causes, such as migraine or pain or illness, or sensory stimulation. And again, kind of giving the individual another way to kind of get that sensory stimulation. Um, so for an individual, like we said, who's biting his finger, some of them we worked with them on biting licorice or chewing gum or trying to get that sensory stimulation in another way. That, does that help? It, it's not an easy behavior. You're right. It's one of the most challenging behaviors. But early studies, even like, uh, like I mentioned by Mark Duran, show that by functional communication training, by teaching the individual to ask for their needs in a more appropriate way, it does reduce dramatically even really severe behaviors like self-injury. So they're not, you know, I think people used to think they were uncontrollable, that they were very biologically driven. But we do, we do find that self-injury functions to gain attention, escape demands, just like every other behavior. I think the only thing that makes it more challenging is that it's probably even, it's much harder to watch your kid hurting himself than it is even to watch them hurting you, you know? The next question is about how many problem behaviors can I tackle at a time? Should I just pick one and try to focus on that, or should I multitask? What's the best way to do this? Uh, yeah, I, that's I'm, I'm just laughing because on a lot of my students' report that's, oh, reports, a lot of my grad students, that's often one of my main criticisms, that they try to tackle too many behaviors at once. And, I, and they'll always say, oh, but the parents or teachers want to address them all at once. And I get it. We all want everything fixed today or yesterday, especially when it's all serious. But it's hard enough, take it from me, like even with my daughter, it's hard enough to focus on one thing and do it well. So what I would say is you really want to pick one behavior at a time and focus on one thing. And once that one behavior is a little bit better, you could focus on a second behavior. The one, uh, I guess, a addendum or, or 
modification I would say to that is that you can focus on multiple behaviors if they're all what we call part of the same response class, meaning they all serve the same function and happen together. So remember the example with Jen going into the library? If mom says, okay, we're going into the library now, Jen screams, yells, bites, and drops to the floor. Those are four different behaviors, but they all serve the same function and that they're all happening together and mom picks her up right after. So they're all serving the same function of getting mom to pick her up. So in that example, you could target all four of those together. The yelling, biting, you know, dropping to the floor kind of thing. Does that make sense? So you can target multiple behaviors as long as they serve the same function. I would definitely not target multiple behaviors that serve different functions at the same time because then you really have to do, as you've seen, a really wide array of interventions and it's going to be very hard to do those all well. Like I said, it's very hard enough for it's hard enough for people to implement one thing well. It's hard enough for me to just remember, okay, prompt my daughter for this one thing every time. So it, it, it's, you know, you really kind of, you want to set yourself up for success and not try to tackle too many things at once, okay? Okay, this is a question. You touched briefly on anxiety, and I know this fall when you speak again, we're, we'll, mm -hmm. sounds like we'll touch on that more then. Right. Okay. So I, I think a lot of families have difficulty unraveling where that line is between anxiety and behavior. Yeah. Like where, where do those things connect? Yeah. This one's yeah. asking about anxiety and negative thinking. So have you seen success uh -huh. with like cognitive behavioral strategies? So yes. What we'll do, like th this relates a little bit to the coping self statements. We'll try to, t we, we work with individuals, we do do cognitive behavioral therapy with, with individuals with autism and other, other developmental disabilities where we try to teach them sort of more positive thinking to kind of replace negative thinking, for example. Um, I think the modifications for how we do it with neurotypical kids are we try to make it a lot more visual and more concrete. So for some of my kids, like we'll make actual kind of two column checklists that on one side we'll say like, here's some positive thoughts or here's some happy thoughts, like here's some sort of negative or anxious thoughts depending on whatever it is. Um, because what we do know is like, let's say, let's take negative thinking, which is a little bit different than uh, anxious thoughts, they might be related. But what we do know is the more, and this is true of everyone, not just individuals with autism, the more you kind of talk about, oh, I'm so miserable, I hate everything, I hate that kid, I hate this, I hate my homework, I hate my life, the more you kind of talk about that, the more you actually feel it. So the notion that venting is a successful intervention strategy has actually been shown to be false. Venting does not help. If you're feeling angry and you hate a kid, one of my kids was drawing pictures of guns and hating that other kid, that's not what you want to do because that's just going to make the kid feel more angry. What you want to do is immediately get them to draw pictures of happy things or things they like or again kind of get yourself out of that mindset and focus on positive things because that is again going to kind of improve your mood depending on what you're looking at. It can be very difficult to get anyone to do that, let alone kids with autism who tend to be very rigid thinkers which is why it's often helpful, like I said, to make very visual concrete lists or, or visual concrete strategies. So for one of my kids, for example, I'll talk about some anxiety talk, but who had anxiety um, and would follow his mom around several times a day saying like, am I sick? Am I sick? Am I breathing right? Am I coughing? Am I coughing? Is my throat okay? <coughs> what we did is we made a social story explaining how every time he asked his mom those questions, it made his anxiety worse. And so his job was going to be to try not to ask mom those questions. And mom's job was going to be not to answer those questions. And of course, he had a, a heavy reward system for, for not answering those, not, not asking those questions. But the visual really helped him. In the story, there was a picture of him asking mom, am I sick? Am I breathing right? And it was crossed out. And when I read in the story, he looked at me and he said, it's crossed out. That means I can't ask that? And I said, right, that means you can't ask that. And that really helped him to understand, OK, every time I ask these questions, it's making it worse. So the same thing applies for all kind of anxious thoughts or negative thinking. That's how we can sometimes explain the kind of complicated cognitive strategies of CBT to kids with autism by making it very visual, making it very concrete, using a lot of pictures and lists and visual supports. <laughs> this is a parent, and she's asking, well, what can I do if I'm struggling to communicate with the teachers to understand that challenging behaviors serve a function? And sometimes they happen because of the environment. That's an excellent question. And you know what, God, I've had that experience so many times. And I wish I could say there was an easy answer. I mean, I think sometimes I've had that problem with parents, too, where parents really don't believe me. And they're like, no, he's just a bad child. I've, I've had a lot of parents say that, too. But I do think it's, it's probably more common with teachers. You're right. Um, 
I mean, the thing I really do try to do is kind of show them sometimes that the behavior can be different in different environments. Sometimes I'll try to demonstrate for them, like, look, you know, if you can model with them, if you can kind of come in one day and say, look, when I reinforce them for this behavior, like every time I reinforce them for sharing, look, they're not um, uh, taking toys from kids anymore. So sometimes you can show them that when you make some changes in the environment, you can see a little bit of change in their behavior. Um, but that can be really hard, yes. I, I wish I could say I've had success with all teachers, but I haven't. There's some teachers who I've never been able to convince that the kid is not a bad kid, sadly enough, and that um, the behavior serve a function. We've had to change the kid's class or had to bring in paras or private aides even to, to kind of work with the kid in the classroom environment. Um, but, and then sometimes when the teachers start seeing a change, they get more buy-in. I would also say, think about counter conditioning or remember my slide on generalized reinforcement. I try to make the teachers happy to see me as much as possible so I'm not this aversive stimulus for them. I bring in lots of treats, I praise them a lot, I try to focus on everything positive they're doing. Because often I think teachers can feel very under attack as well and very blamed. You know, it's very tricky because you want to emphasize that the kid's behavior serves a function and is maybe only happening in that environment, but you want to do that in a way without blaming the teacher. Um, so it is a very, very tricky thing. But I think sometimes just sort of explaining or taking data, it's hard to argue with data. If you can go in and take data or have a psychologist take data or an extern or somebody go in and take data, it can sometimes be as clear as day. Look, every time child calls out and teacher says, stop calling out, raise your hand, he calls out again two minutes later. Sometimes when you see a train of 20 of those incidents, it's a little hard to argue with that. And again, you say it in a non-blaming way. You say to the teacher, yeah, it makes sense you're doing that because the normal strategy that usually works is to tell a kid not to do something which doesn't really work. But, you know, you want to phrase it as you could totally see why the teacher is doing that, but can you see based on this data, based on this graph, how every time the teacher says that it's more likely to occur. Sometimes when the teacher actually sees a transcript or sees the data, or see, which goes for a parent too, I can, I, if I actually, do, let me just show you really quickly. When I was showing a mom, can you guys see the slide still? Did you yeah. see you still there? Yep, we okay. still see you. Yep. So I showed a mom this specific transcript of a real life case. So it becomes hard to argue with the fact that, for example, the child's behavior function to gain the mom, mom's attention. You can see it very clearly here. Mom calls, you know, BR honey, the BR is uh, fake initials, BR yells back, no. BR yells duty, mom responds, that's enough. He runs down the hallway yelling and flapping. BR says duty, he starts bothering his sister. Mom yells, leave her alone. He pulls on his sister's shirt. Mom yells, leave her alone. He continues to bother his sister. Mom yells, leave her alone. When you show a parent a transcript like this, it becomes really easy for them sometimes to see the pattern that, oh wow, he's totally, the functions, this is totally to gain my attention. Whereas you might not realize it when you're in it. And the same goes for a teacher. Does that help? They're asking about co-occurring mental health disorders. So how frequently do you see co-occurring mental health disorders or medical disorders um, with autism? And, and what, are, what should they do in that case? Do the same assessment and treatment strategies apply or are there different things you'd need to do? Sure. sure, great question, really great question. We do know individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities are more at risk for a whole host of, of chronic medical conditions. They are more at risk for GI problems. They are more at risk for a lot of different problems. Um, but in particular, mental health disorders, they're much more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. Um, some studies show as many as 80% um, have an anxiety disorder or at least symptoms of anxiety. Um, estimates are anywhere from 40 to 80%, depending on how the anxiety disorder is diagnosed. And of course, that might be an underreport given a lot of individuals with autism or developmental disabilities are nonverbal. And so it's very difficult for them to report if they're afraid or anxious about something. So these are probably underestimates. So yes, these are very, very common for comorbid physical and mental health conditions are very common problems. Um, in terms of treatment, like I said, you know, the same treatment strategies do apply. You just want to consider these co-occurring co conditions as possible setting events or antecedents, if that makes sense. So if you know that an individual is having GI problems, then yeah, tummy aches could be a setting event um, for their problematic behavior. So you might want to have um, a pain or illness checklist that goes back and forth between the parent and teacher. So that if mom knows, okay, he's having a tummy ache this morning, she might want to send a little note into the teacher or they could have a pain rating scale that day where the teacher says, oh look, yes, he's having a lot of tummy aches today. 
maybe I'm not going to give him his most challenging assignment today, but maybe I'll give him a slightly easier assignment today or more breaks or something of that sort. So based on knowing what the setting events and antecedents are for your kids, you can be a little bit preventative or proactive and modify what you're going to do. Same goes for um, mental health challenges. Uh, um, ADHD, impulsivity, or inattention can be possible setting events. So you might want to know, okay, if your kid is more likely to be impulsive, maybe you don't want to teach him his colors sitting in a chair. If you're in a flexible classroom, maybe you want to teach him his colors by saying, okay, run to the color blue, run to the color green. Um, an example my late advisor always gave, um, which I think is a great one, and which I've used with a lot of kids. So I think you can, again, take that knowledge and then use it um, when you're developing intervention strategies. And again, same thing goes for anxiety. If you know your kid's anxious, you would approach, you would approach it in a lot of the same ways, figuring out what are the situations that make them anxious and how, how can we prevent that ahead of time by maybe offering them more choices, by um, increasing predictability so that they know what's going to happen, um, it providing advanced warnings, um, and making the anxiety-provoking situation less aversive. Uh, so the quick example I'll give of that, and then I know we're out of time, is um, for a kid of mine who was afraid of the doctor, and I'll talk way more about this in my fall talk, but for a kid of mine who was terrified of the doctor and it took six nurses or doctors to hold him down, we were able to use his preservative interest, which was potato head. We were able to pair that with the doctor's office, so that when he got to the doctor's office, the doctor said, look what I have, I have potato head. And he knew Potato Head lived at the doctor's office, so he was only allowed to get Potato Head when he went to the doctor's. That really gave him a positive association with the doctor's office, so it made him less likely to engage in escape-motivated problem behavior at the doctor's. Does that make sense? So all of this information will help you in developing a lot of the same strategies we talked about today.